Who does not speak Dutch? Damn it. Okay. And you probably mind if I do it in Dutch, right? All right. <laughs> all right, prepare for a lot more us and us than uh, if it's in English. Uh, all right, this is my session, listen up Drupal, uh, symphony style API building. Uh, so these are the topics. I first want to introduce myself, uh, give a little, a little introduction about event subscribers, uh, the REST API spec that we have at MediaMonks, redefining how we work, can work with controllers and how to do the actual API building with it. And if we have time, we have some bonus content, but I think we won't make it, but you can look it up later in the, in the slides yourself. And some conclusions to take away. Um, so, who am I? I'm uh, Robert, and I'm a PHP developer at MediaMonks. I'm not sure we're not well known in the Drupal community yet, I think. Um, but we're a global creative production partner, and it's a fancy description for that we do everything with digital in the entire world. Uh, we have 10 offices and we are with 650 monks around the world. And it's not all Drupal, we have a small Drupal team, but we do everything from AR to VR to banners, websites, everything. And um, I mainly work with, the logo is a little bit faded, but I work with Symphony Framework and Sonata. Does anyone here know Sonata? Actual done work with it? Yeah. Awesome. I know you did. <laughs> um, also, I'm in really interested in high performance uh, serverless architecture <coughs> and event sourcing. So if you want to speak to me about it, find me afterwards. And to be really honest, <laughs> I don't know Drupal. I cannot build a site with it. So, which. Um, but I do have the following goals with it, uh, because I'm a team lead and I work both with the Symphony team and the Drupal team. And uh, my goal basically is to create a flexible team, so I would really like to see that Drupal developers can work more on Symphony projects and that Symphony framework developers can work on Drupal projects. Um, and they can do that by combining the strains, like we can learn from Drupal and Drupal can learn from Symphony side and basically get people off their islands. That's my goal. And for Drupal specific, look beyond Drupalisms. And um, my own personal goal is make Drupal look more like Symfony Framework. Um, please note that since I've already told you, I don't know Drupal. So if you see something that you think is really stupid to do in Drupal, you're probably right. It's stupid, uh, but it's just my take on how I could do something in Drupal the way I um, know it in Symphony Framework. So, event subscribers, I think, does anyone who all know event subscribers? Who created one? All right, that's a lot of people, that's good. Um, but first, what is Symphony actually? Um, because this is a sentence I hear a lot. Drupal 8 is using Symphony Framework, and it's actually wrong. Um, because we have Symphony as a set of components, and we have Symfony as a framework. And those are two different things. And the framework, just like Drupal, uses the components of Symfony to create a framework. And Drupal uses also a lot of those components to create Drupal. So the components are not the same as the framework. So Drupal 8 uses some of those components from Symfony. And in Symfony framework, we have a concept of bundles, which is actually quite similar as uh, you have modules in Drupal. It's basically the same, you have some, uh, some documentation or a source folder with your code in it, and uh, you have, can have some routing files in there. It's basically the same, but unfortunately, they're not compatible. Um, what components does Drupal 8 actually use? Well, mostly uh, they use HTTP kernel, the routing, dependency injection, and YAML. And there's a few more, but I don't think for this in this session, it's important to list them all. So HTTP kernel, uh, I think everyone opened their index.php file at some point, and you basically saw this. And what HTTP kernel does, um, it converts a, re a request from the browser, from the user, uh, into a, re a request object. 
and it will transform it into a response object and that is what the user eventually would get in his browser or phone, whatever. Um, and you can change behavior on what happens in between that process with event subscribers. And it's a really, really powerful method to change the behavior and Drupal is already using a lot of those internally. So which kernel events are there actually? We have kernel request and uh, you can use it to add more information to, uh, to your request. You can maybe add some ID or some logger ID to your request object. You can use it to verify something, maybe verify a token or, or authentication. Uh, you can use it to find a cache hit and if you might find a cache hit, you can directly return a response and skip all the rest of the framework. There's kernel controller and this allows you to uh, override or set uh, the controller that's being called in your app. Uh, you can also use it to initialize services or do some kind of parameter conversion. Uh, controller arguments, this is not well documented, but it, you can actually use this to verify the arguments that are set in your controller. There's kernel view, and this is heavily used in Drupal. I think you all know that if you return an array from uh, a controller, uh, it will transform in HTML and you can pass all array stuff to it and it will parse some HTML which is something I've never used myself, but this is what it uses, kernel.view. Uh, you can also use, use it to serialize content, like to define if it should return JSON or message back or XML something. Uh, kernel response, you can add it to, uh, use it to add some kind of headers, maybe uh, to set that it's a JSON response or set another type of ID something stored in cache or inject some content. Uh, content injection is uh, used by the, um, by the profiler uh, that you might use uh, because it will add a developer bar at the bottom of the page and this is done in this, uh, by using this uh, event. Kernel exception, you can catch the, event, catch the exception, do something with it and uh, maybe change the, uh, the exception or use the exception info to guide the user, like maybe your login information is wrong and you can use that info in the form to tell someone what, what went wrong actually. And finish request, you can use it to clean up some services or send out some email or whatever you can think of. And this one's interesting, kernel terminate, and it basically it does exactly the same as the previous one, except this one does it when the user already received the content. Uh, but this only works with PHP FPM. So if you have that, it could be really useful. Um, so how can we create an event subscriber? Uh, I think a lot of you already did this at some point. Uh, in this example, um, we listen for the response event and we add a custom header uh, with the name custom and it, uh, the content will be set to Drupal Love Symphony. And you can also optionally set a priority, and this was very important for the thing that I'll show later, um, to, make it, to make sure if it's called earlier than other event subscribers maybe. Um, so you can register it like this. I think everyone worked with the services YAML at some point. Um, so you set a cache uh, tag, or some, sorry, a uh, container tag, and you set it to event subscriber in Drupal. Um, but this is actually the new way how you can do it from Drupal 8.5 onwards. You can skip the name that you define yourself, that you have to come up with, and just use the fully qualified class name of, your, of, your, of the thing that you created, and then you can omit the class, and it will assume that the class is the same as the name of the, um, of the service, which saves you another line of code, which is, I think, great. And I'll have more examples for this later on. Um, so now when you call a uh, dual request, you will see the custom header being added uh, to the response and it was that easy to create an event subscriber into your system. Um, but what would actually be practical use uh, to do this? Um, like I said at MediaMonks, we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of people working and we don't only do Drupal, but we do Symfony and we do Node and we do .NET and we basically everything Python. Um, so we had a lot of different, um, different back-enders, different front-enders, um, and what happened is that everyone came up with sort of their own API uh, spec, like how does pagination work, how do we handle errors. Uh, we used to have a thing called success, true or false, but 
when would it actually fail because people would send errors and then say success through because the request itself succeeded but with errors so um, all the dev leads we have came together and we decided all right we need some uh, standardized uh, rest api spec for this and that's the exact thing that we did if you're interested you can look it up um, it's the thing that we use in the company it basically takes a, a bunch of stuff from twitter and google apis and we combine it to something that we really liked so i decided to create a symphony framework bundle for this um, so we can basically return anything from a controller and it will be automatically converted into this spec so then you can't do it wrong and it's a bunch of event subscribers really it's customizable, so you can implement your own. Um, if you have a different spec or want to modify the spec, you, you can actually do it. It's fully tested. And if you're interested, you can find it on our GitHub page. Um, this is also the point that I started doing unit tests. Um, if you didn't do it yet, please do. It makes your code so much more reliable and it's really fun to do it, especially if you want to put something on GitHub. There's a bunch of tools available like Travis and Scrutinizer and they really make sure that you uh, can show off that the thing that you um, put on there is actually good quality. You can test against different versions of PHP and, and the frameworks. And I thought it, it's really much fun to get to the 100% code coverage and just figure out how you can actually achieve it. So um, some code, that's why we're here, right? Um, this is uh, just an example controller and it, luckily it looks exactly the same as it would in Drupal or in Symfony framework. Um, so I think you'll all recognize this. It's just a simple action returning an integer in this example and then it will transform it into uh, JSON and it will just wrap it into some data. Um, in this case, I return an array and it will frame an array. I think you understand what's going on. Um, in this case, we have an offset paginated response and this is also defined by our spec how we do this. Um, so I can, again, return some kind of data set the offset and the limit and optionally the total amount of entities that I might have. Uh, we can also uh, return uh, set custom uh, status codes or add custom headers from the controller directly. It's really easy. And also exceptions are handled automatically um, and it will use the name of the exception in the error code. So that's very useful. Also it will work with Symfony HTTP exceptions so you can just throw a not found exception and it will again use the code so the front end can automatically pick this up and do the thing that they think is right. Uh, to make it more fancy, and I'll get into more detail on this later, if you're using Symfony form, um, there's a really powerful validation in there, and you can just validate it, and if it's invalid, you can just throw a form validation exception, which could look something like this. And it will automatically wrap all the errors from the form, put it in the right uh, spec, and it will tell the front end exactly what went wrong. So this, this saves us a lot of time. Um, to have, a, have an, a bundle which does this for us automatically. Um, but are you thinking, what about Drupal? What can we do with it? Um, so I started preparing it for Drupal and I actually split the bundle into, uh, into a package which just relies on HTTP kernel and uh, a Symfony bundle which is just some glue code. And uh, so it basically is also a YAML file and some configuration options. And now I have uh, a separate package. I could try to integrate it in Drupal. So I just required the package with Composer. I hope everyone's using Composer now. Um, and I created a custom module with two YAML files. And I think everyone knows the info file. Um, and then I created the services file and I just created all the services that I need. And um, I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with the auto wire function already. Um, but it's very easy instead of, uh, if you define all the services that you have by their class name, uh, the Symfony DI container can automatically match uh, the services with the requirements for the other services. So in this case, if you set auto wire to true, all the arguments for the REST API event subscriber are automatically matched. So this saves you a lot of time uh, configuring all your, uh, your services in the YAML file. So there are a few more services, but they didn't fit on the, on the slide. 
So then I created a controller in Drupal and um, I went to the endpoint and it showed me the hello world wrapped in the in data. So I was really excited and this basically got me hungry for more. So then I moved on to controllers, which is something I'm not sure how much time, uh, how many times you actually create custom controllers in Drupal because you have really fancy modules available to do API stuff with. Um, but first again, dependency injection. Um, this is the preferred method for accessing and using services in Drupal 8. It should be whatever, uh, use but never possible. And um, basically it means stop doing this. I see this a lot and I also see it in core and people just copy paste it. Please don't, it's, it's not the right, the right thing to do in OOP. And I was talking to it with a colleague and I showed him that this is exactly the same thing. It would achieve the same thing. And also it's something you shouldn't be doing. It's really bad practice. So use proper dependency injection, please. So controllers as services, does anyone know what's, what it is? No one used it? All right. Um, it means you don't have a controller base. That's what it means. And you only inject the service that you, that you need. And um, there's a few advantages there. Um, you can have your configuration with dependency injection, which I really like. And when you open your controller, you can see all the services that are available for you. There's no more inline at far type uh, type hints that you see a lot of the times. You don't have to do it, especially when using the, the Drupal service. You have no clue what the service actually is typed into, so you need to do it manually. It helps prevent getting fat controllers, so don't do all the stuff in your controllers. Keep it simple. And your controllers are um, also really easy to unit test when you do this. <coughs> There's also disadvantages, obviously, because there always are. You need to create your own helper functions, but you can solve that if you have some helper functions that you do over and over again. You can also use some kind of abstract controller, maybe. Uh, a controller is usually, usually not reusable anyway, so why bother? And it takes more work to configure, but I put a small star there because with uh, Drupal 8.5 you can use the auto wiring and it gets really, really easy to do this. So, how to do it in, uh, in Drupal? Um, this is the thing that I see most of the time when controller uh, services are being used. Um, it has the create function and it implements, implements the container injection interface. But you can actually do it without, because now it's still coupled to both Drupal and Symfony container. There's a piece of code there that's not really related to your controller. So you can also do it just like this. And I think it's really nice and clean, and you don't, it saves you already six lines of code. It's way more readable. So you can register it like this. It also shows, again, the benefits of auto-wiring. For this example, I have a word generator class, and the controller, as you saw, requires a word generator. So this is all that you need. It will wire it automatically. Um, for routing, um, you can actually set it up like this. Um, and this, at the time that I was playing around with this, uh, which is around a year ago, this wasn't documented. Um, so I just tried it because this is how I was used to do it in Symfony uh, framework. And it actually worked. So as a good developer, I added it to the documentation. So you can all read it up in the structure of routes page, I believe. Um, so, and then it will actually work. Uh, so this, this is really easy. Then I think the, the most exciting thing for is, is to control our annotations. Um, and all the Symfony people work with the, the extra bundle. Does anyone know it? All right, I see someone nodding. Um, um, this is something, is, this is used a lot in Symfony Framework. Um, it's optional, it's also highly debated, but this saves you a lot of configuration in all different YAML files, and I personally like this a lot. You can just have an action, put some annotations to it, and it will be automatically accessible. And you can also uh, make sure that it's only accessible by get or post, or whatever you configure. You can do automatically um, do parameter conversion, uh, render a template or set cache header security and then you can just create your action without uh, having to go through several YAML files. But can you do this in Drupal? Well, I have to disappoint you, no, you cannot. Uh, but um, 
it's all based again on event subscribers. So when I got that figured out, I was like, well, yes, we can. I think we can actually do this in Drupal. And that's when the fun started. And I started porting this to Drupal and it, it works. And so this is actually available for you for a few months already um, with, a, with a, a custom module, which I'll show the link later. And some of the things changed. So um, registering this as, as routes, uh, you only have to do this in your code, in your YAML file, and just set the right uh, module name, set it to the type annotation, and then everything will be picked up automatically. So you can just start creating your controllers, just annotate them with add route, and it will just pick it up automatically, which is really easy to use. Uh, security is different in Drupal than it's in Symfony. Uh, Symfony has its own component, security component, and Drupal is not using it, so this had to be ported. Um, so I believe these are the most uh, used things in Drupal, and they all work, basically, so you can use roles or whatever you like, or even the custom method, uh, you, you can set it. Uh, template, um, again, I believe this is the right format for how Drupal tries to resolve templates. Correct me if I'm wrong, then I'll update it. Uh, you can either mark it with just add template and it will figure it out automatically based with, uh, on the name of the, of the controller and the actions and using reflection, but you can also manually define what it should use. Uh, cache, again, uh, this was exactly the same as in Symfony, so this did, didn't actually need porting. Um, it's really flexible, you can set expire tags or public, private, whatever you like. And then there's parameter conversion, and please note that this is a different parameter conversion than the one in Drupal. Bear with me, it's using the same name, so I kept it like that. Um, you can use, use it automatically, just set at param converter and it will automatically try to figure out uh, what kind of node this is based on the name um, or the ID in the URL and it will automatically resolve and you can make it a little more specific by setting the bundle so it, you make sure that's actually an article and if it's not found it will just throw an HTTP not found exception. Um, you can use this to also use work with dates so you can uh, set the name like a start and end uh, point in your URL and it will automatically convert them into daytime so you don't have to do that manually. And you can also create your own, uh, just create, uh, implement this interface and tag it with uh, the param converter tag and it should be picked up. Uh, I was also trying to convert the PSR7 support which is available in the Symfony bundle and while I was, I was messing around with it, uh, it was already working while I was still doing development on it, and I found out it's already working uh, by default. Group already does PSR7, so that's great to know. Um, this got me really excited. Like now I can actually do a lot of the things that I do in Symfony Framework directly in Drupal, and I think this shows really how much uh, things are actually similar. So how does this, how does this work? Um, it only acts on kernel events, the ones that I just showed you and it modifies request and response objects to do the conversion from the annotations to that it, make, that it actually works in your system. Uh, for routing, it's slightly different. It uses the routing route dynamic event from Drupal. So basically then it picks up um, uh, the annotation and it will read the directory or the, for, the mo for the module, whatever you have configured there. Uh, the development process for the annotation was to simply require the bundle from Symfony and create a custom module and I started listing all the services and then everything would break, it, it wouldn't work and I, first I didn't know why uh, but then I started looking at the priorities for the event subscriber because Drupal already has a lot of these event subscribers and I just needed to make sure that mine were triggered before the ones from Drupal and that's why the, the priorities really came in handy. Um, I had to refactor a lot of those um, event subscribers because they weren't compatible, especially uh, the security one, it's, it just, it's completely different. And then I decided to completely remove the dependency for the, the framework bundle because I thought it didn't make much sense to require the bundle while only uh, a little part of it was actually used. And I also ran into compatibility issues where the bundle was requiring different versions of Symfony components than Drupal was. Um, 
so that, that made it really difficult to install it. So I just removed everything from the bundle um, and reused everything to create a separate module for Drupal. I did run into a lot of cache annoyances while trying to do all of this. So I have a few tips if you ever want to try fiddling around with routes and services. And like I said, never do this in production. It will kill your performance completely. Uh, I think everyone knows this. You can do it in your settings PHP file. Uh, make sure you have actually it shows errors on your page and it disables all the caches. At least that's what I was told. Uh, but it, you know it's not true, right? Um, so while working with uh, the routes, uh, it was really difficult because I had to use uh, Drush or, or um, Drupal console. Every time I created an annotation with a route, I needed to uh, flush the caches and it was really annoying. So I created another event subscriber and I think it's the ugliest thing ever, but it, it does its job. So um, whenever Drupal starts, the first thing it does, it, it cleans uh, the route cache. It rebuilds the, the routes. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to use it only in development. And also disable container caching. If you're working with old services, it's really annoying that you again have to uh, flush the cache every time. And I asked a few guys and they didn't know how to do it. And I started looking at the Drupal kernel, like where does it does the dumping? And it turned out it was actually really easy. Uh, the third parameter of your Drupal kernel is called allow dumping. And if you set it to false, it will just stop doing that. So Doing all of that things that it made it really easy to work with. Responses were really slow, but that was for me less annoying than having all the caches. And if you are using Drupal console, and then it's really easy to search for routes or services using these uh, methods. It saved me a lot of time as well. Um, you can try the module. Um, it's available on Drupal.org. Um, it's actually, it's primary living spaces in GitHub, uh, but everyone told me like if you put it on GitHub, no one will use it. Um, and sorry, but it's using PSR standards, so it will never get the security badge, uh, but it should be all safe and good to use. Um, so how can we use this to actually build an API in Drupal, uh, the way I'm used to do it? So for content, I really like to use Fractal, and it's a library. Um, available from the PHP League, uh, the League of Extraordinary Packages. And it's basically, it's a group of, of packages which has a really high standard. And it's difficult to get your package in there, so expect high quality there. And what it does is actually, it, it, it only translates uh, a piece of data and it transforms it into an array. That's basically all it does. And it, it looks something like this. It's a really simple example. But in this case, we assume it, we have a node article, a node, uh, an article node, and we just transform it, getting the ID, title, and body from it. And as you can see, it's really readable, and we just have an object which takes care of this conversion. Um, um, you can also use includes. So if your article has an, has an author, you can, um, you can make sure that it gets included, and this is totally optional for the front end to decide. Uh, because they can set the include to author and maybe more when it comes separated. And you can enable it like this or use the request object. It's just a simple example. So you have an idea on how it works. Um, keep this in mind. Um, I think Drupal does the same thing as it does in, in Symfony. We work with Doctrine ORM mainly and it, it, you have the pain of lazy loading. So when you've got an object and it has a relationship to another object, it will do another query. And if that happens a lot in your loop, you're doing thousands of queries without even noticing it. So make sure to optimize your queries at all time. And content <coughs> could come from anywhere, actually. It can come from um, Drupal, it can, can come from your database, it can also come from Elasticsearch or Solar. Um, make sure you use the right place to store your data and, and it's really flexible and basically the transformers don't care where your data is coming from as long as it's some kind of object or even array you can transform it into something else. Um, again, you can just try this. Uh, there's no weird dependencies or anything. It's just PHP. You can just use Composer to try this out. Then forms. I'm not sure about you, but I don't like working with forms. It's annoying. Um, and I think everyone really hates it. But with Symfony form, it, it makes it a lot easier. 
and they have a great, great builder. Uh, it's highly customizable, it has powerful validation, and a small example would be this. Um, and I know Drupal has its form API, but speaking to my colleagues, I, they really would like to work with this more instead of the Drupal form API. Um, because it's all object oriented and it's really easy to make changes to it. Uh, so in this case, we have a title, we set it to text type and set some constraints, it can't be blank and there's a minimum and maximum length. And an example API implementation in Drupal could look like this. You have your form, uh, you create your, the instance of your form type, um, you submit your values against the, the, the validation and if it's not valid, we throw the exception. And then we have automatically for free, we get all the, the, error for, uh, the error output from the bundle that I showed before. And if it's actually all valid, you can just use node storage create to actually store it in Drupal. Um, and if I did it wrong, then just please correct me later. Uh, and then you can just send a response with the ID and set the correct header because that's how we do it in REST. Um, so that's the API side. You can also do this with Twig which luckily is also uh, the template engine for Drupal. Um, so on the controller side, you can have a form like this. This uses the builder as an example. Um, and again, you just call handle request in this case, <coughs> uh, and it will automatically figure out if the form was submitted, yes or no. And if it was uh, submitted and valid, it, you can again use just uh, the data to store it in Drupal and do some redirect to some other page. And if not, um, you can just get create view and it will create a pretty view object for you. <laughs> and in Twig, you can just use this. And I was actually corrected by a colleague and I saw I didn't put it in here. You can actually use one line of code for this instead of three. I think it's called form row underscore row. Just pass the form and it will render your entire form for you. That's, that's all there to it. And it will also automatically show any kind of error that the user might have made. Um, and there are a lot of different form types available. I've just listed a few, money, URL, range. There's so many different form types already. You can also just create your own. Um, and there's also validators for every need. Um, the most common ones are already present. And again, you can just create your own if you have something specific. And again, this, this is something you can just try in Symf or in Drupal. It doesn't really matter. It's, it's a library and it's, Symfony Framework uses it, but it doesn't mean that you can't do it in Drupal. Drupal has its own form API, but if you really like working with this, you can just do it. It's, it's all PHP. Um, because it's too short of time to show you everything combined, uh, I created a small example module, which combines basically all the things that you saw in the presentation. So the uh, annotations, um, uh, the controllers and services, Symfony form, all is in there. It's again, uh, the link is also on the last slide. Bonus content. Mm, yeah, probably we can do it. Um, another practical example of event subscribers is uh, CEO. And I'm not sure if anyone, no, does anyone know pre-render? Okay. Um, I'll get to that later. Uh, we've been decoupled, doing decoupled websites since, uh, since a few years already. And it really is, makes it a lot easier for us to create a product. We, we are, like I said, we're quite big. So we have um, a separate team of front-enders and they're even split in two. So we have templators and scripters and then we have all the different backends. Uh, so it's, it's really helpful that we have decoupled websites to create the best user experience. And um, they all use their own frameworks and I, we don't want to tell them like you need to do it in Twig or you need to do it in in, in Django template engine, I don't know what they use. And so they have all creative freedom and they can have page transitions and animations and stuff. But what about CEO? Well, that's an, uh, an issue, of course. Uh, and there are some solutions for this. You can either ignore it, just if you don't care about CEO, which could be the case for maybe short living campaigns or something. Um, you can assume everyone uses Google. So if you're aiming for the Dutch market, uh, Google really understands single page applications. So you don't need to do much about it. They can just understand everything that you do. If you're doing something worldwide, um, you need to do something more. And you can decide to duplicate routing in backend. So if someone presses F5, you can make sure that the same route is registered in, in Drupal 
and it would render like uh, a slim down version or make sure that the, the, the content is there. It doesn't have to look pretty, but then the content is there and it would be indexed. Or you could use something like free render or phantom JS. Um, because no one knows pre-render. Pre-render is a tool, um, I think it was created by GitHub. Um, and you can just send it a page and they will uh, load the page for you and they will create a DOM object. So you, you send it to the URL and you get the DOM object rendered with JavaScript. So that's really powerful. And Phantom Jazz is basically the, uh, the new version of pre-render or not really true, but it's the new version or the new thing that you can use instead of pre-render. And there's also, pre-render also has an online service, pre-render.io, and they offer this process as a service, which is really helpful. So a common implementation with this is you, a request comes in and you detect uh, if it's a bot or not, and, and you can do this again with an event subscriber. And if it's a bot, you can send it to pre-render, pre-render will uh, do all the JavaScript for you, and then you just, um, respond to the user, which in this case would be a bot with all the JavaScript rendered in it. Um, but that doesn't really work when you're behind a, a CDN or, or some load balancer. You usually don't get the user agent. Uh, and it's not really efficient to keep sending those requests over and over again. So what we decided to do is we crawl the website and then in the background process, we send all the requests to pre-render. We store it in the database and whenever a request comes in, we just find a match in the database and then inject the crawled content, which could be like a part of a diff or maybe we inject the title text or the meta text, and then we return it to the client. Um, so what we use for this is we created a PHP crawler, which can crawl your own website. And it's using the PHP generators, uh, which is really cool. Um, just try it once and then I think you'll understand how it works because it's, it's pretty weird. It's highly customizable. Um, you can have like whitelisting of URLs, so you only make sure that it's going through a set of URLs or blacklisting, like you, you don't want to index your search page, for instance, because it's always changing or don't never want to have your admin panel uh, being spidered. You can use it for normalization, like if you have uh, different uh, query parameters, you can all make sure that it's all the same page. Um, so a basic example is this, just put in the URL, and for each hit, and it will just return everything that it finds. It's really easy to use. Um, getting page data, you can use the DOM crawler object. Uh, there's also uh, a CSS selector that you can use, also really helpful. And you can store this information in your, in your local database. Um, this is an example of using a blacklist, so make sure your admin doesn't get uh, crawled or your search doesn't get crawled. Um, how you can implement it in Drupal, I can't show you with code, uh, but you can have like a console command um, which can do the spidering, have an event subscriber just like we have in Symfony, uh, which takes the request, finds it, matches it, and returns it to the user. And um, keeping it up to date, that, that's the thingy. Uh, you can do it timed, like do it daily or do it hourly, it doesn't really matter, whatever you think is needed. Uh, you can have CMS triggers. Uh, like if someone changes an article, you could maybe put the link in a queue and make sure that it's updated again. Um, or you can use priority. This is something we, we did for the Radio 538 website. Uh, that whenever the crawler was running, it would detect changes in the pages. And whenever there was a change detected, it would raise the priority. And if no change was detected, it would lower the priority. So, and then we would put it in different groups and based on what group it was in, it would crawl more often. So like the home page would be crawled really frequently and the about page would only be crawled every week or so. And another really big benefit of this, you will have a full site search. Uh, so we also put all these results into Elasticsearch and you can just have, uh, just type a word and it will find anything. If it's defined in front and the back end doesn't matter, it's all the content from your website combined. Um, again, you can give it a try. Uh, the crawler uh, component is also on GitHub and you can look at the Symfony crawler bundle to see there's a lot of things you can directly port into Drupal, so it, you can probably use it. Um, so one file of sleep, we were, it was the after lunch uh, slot of F, after all, so. Um, event subscribers are really, really powerful and they can change a lot of behavior. Um, 
I believe that Symfony developers can actually work out work on Drupal projects without knowing anything about Drupal at all. It's all PHP. And and I think that's the thing that I want to achieve, that to show people like you can use things from other islands and, and combine them and make sure that we get off those islands. And we can really learn from each other's solutions. I think uh, there's a lot of things that I, w I see in Symphony Framework that I really would like to see in Drupal. Uh, but the other way around, I think it's amazing how Drupal handles its content. And I can only be very jealous about it because there's not something we have like that in, in Symphony with, with Doctrine ORM. So when comparing those two, Doctrine ORM is really powerful, but also it doesn't have things like versioning out of the box and, and uh, multilingual stuff. So that's something that I would really love to see ported to Symphony Framework. And there's, there's more than just modules on Drupal.org. Uh, I've seen it before where someone asks, like, can I use this? I need to do something like this. And people say, I didn't find it on Drupal.org. But if you just go to Packagist, um, there's a lot of stuff you can use. And it doesn't have to be a Drupal module for you to use it in Drupal. It's PHP. You can just try stuff, even though there's no Drupal module for it. So I think that's the most important thing that I wanted to tell you today. Um, Get off those islands, look beyond the Drupalisms. There's so much more in the world of PHP than just the modules that you have available. So um, that's it for now. Um, thanks for your attention, and are there any questions? Questions? Yes. Uh, you showed the uh, API REST bundle in the, uh, the beginning of your talk. Yeah. Uh, do you know about API platform? I do. And is it like? Uh, uh, it's a really, it's really great, and I really want to try it. Um, What's the reason you build it? Because I don't think it's like uh, JSON all day standards and all no, it's not. Media stuff. No, we looked at it a couple of times. Actually, we created this before API platform existed, um, and I look at API platform sometimes and we will play around with it. Just like GraphQL, it's really powerful, it's really good. Um, but usually our sites have such, uh, so many uh, different things or customizations needed or custom endpoints that it's usually easier to implement them by yourself using Fractal than to use the out-of-the-box yeah, solutions. The, the, the whole the LD link data uh, standardization is like really powerful. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it is. It is. And probably I see a future where we combine the things together, like we can use API platform and combine them with our own custom endpoints. Yeah. Other questions? All right. Well, I guess that's it then. Thanks.
Ja, maar dan heb je nog steeds dat je dat op iedere request gaat doen. Nee, nou ja, nee, nee, precies, nee, nee, maar ik dacht meer van als je kijkt, van hij zit in mijn cache. Oh, zo. Ja, ja, ja. Voor ja, ja. je de hele website bent, je zult daarin laten, ja? dan heb je hem altijd één keer. Voor mm -hmm. ik kan dan checken, oké, ik ben niet meer een cache. Ja, ja, dat vind ik wel een goede inderdaad. Het enige nadeel denk ik ermee is dat je dan alleen pagina's gaat vallen die je nooit bezocht zijn. Ja, oh, dat is wel. Ja, dat is wel. Ja. Dus dat, dat is wel. Maar ik vind het ja. wel leuk. Ja, ja, ik vind het interessant toch. Oké, okay, nou mooi. Dat was gelijk. Dat is, dat is ja. de bedoeling. Graag, ja. oké. Okay. Dankjewel.